say hi to him so I can get you on tape. What do you want me on tape for? You don't need me on tape. <laughs> How you doing, White Eagle? Well, for a lovely lady like you, come on, sit down, join the Sure. Chief in a powwow. Sure, why not? <laughs> Aurora. You want to shoot it now? Oh, yeah, it's going. It's He's going. got it going. Laura, she's the face of the misty light. Um. Laura. <laughs> You remember my wife a couple of years ago, the little Filipino girl you was telling me about? She's grown up, didn't Oh, yeah. She... <laughs> oh, yeah. Sure. So, how you been? You been feeling a lot better? Oh, yes. I, uh, I've given up my wheelchair. And I throw away my walking stick. And I'm walking on my own two hands. Well, that's great. Great. That's great. Great. And I got up this morning and said, Wow, I made it again. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, you look a lot better. Oh, you look good. good. That's good. Uh, yesterday we had 6,500 people. Oh my gosh. No kidding. This is the biggest jet meet each year. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I was That's amazed great. just coming in today. Well, I think people are beginning to find out that their heritage isn't just all across seas. No, no, it's here. Like the lady said to me, she says, she came up this morning and said, Chief, you know, she says, I have a little Indian in here. And I says, you do? She said, yes. I said, okay. I says, uh, don't bother me, see you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, that's great. That's great. <laughs> there. Yeah, we would have been up yesterday, but she takes skating lessons up in Fort Wayne. She's she skating. Oh on yeah, ice. she's my little ice skater. She's skating on thin ice. Oh well, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, especially when I have school grades come around. <laughs> oh, wow. you do that? Was that how she fell down there today? <laughs> well, she fell down yesterday, had her feet way up in the air, and her butt was sliding. <laughs> I'm digging it. Wow. Okay, thank you. Do you have troubles? Do you want me to help you? Come on, no, Tiff. That's all right. Gentlemen, to many of you, I need no introduction, but every year we do have new people come around. So I'll introduce myself. My name is White Eagle. I'm from Grand River Reservation, Ontario, Canada. One of our very famous Indians from that reservation was Tonto J. Silverheels. Another one has just become famous, Graham Green, and you saw him in Kicking Bird in Dances with Wolves. And his home is right at the back of my mother's home on the reservation. So Graham Green, Kicking Bird, and I are neighbors. Today, we are going to 
discuss many things, and you people are going to help me, because what you tell me or what you ask will lead in any direction. I can start off with one small thing, go on to Geronimo, leave Geronimo, and go on to Sequoia of the Cherokee or whatever. So it is you people who will be making the show with your questions. It's surprising in this part of the country the great number of people we have who have Indian blood. I had an awful nice man come to me this morning and he says, my great great grandfather was a Sioux. I said, oh, so what does that make you? He said, well, I'm a 32nd Sioux. I said, oh, but you have to be careful. He looked at me in alarm, he said, careful of what? I said, when you're shaving yourself, for heaven's sake, don't cut yourself, you lose your Indian blood. <laughs> but I had a dear lady come up to me last week, and she said, you know, Chief, she says, I have a little Indian in me. I said, you do? She says, oh, yes. I said, well, don't bother me, see your doctor. You'll get it later over there. <laughs> now, I'm going to open up by asking you folks what you would like to hear. If you have any questions, get it straight from the, uh, the chief's mouth. The real story, the story behind the story. This, uh, yesterday, a gentleman came up to me, he said, uh, I keep horses. How did you Indians break in horses? Well, I said, my people were canoe people. We weren't out on the plains and horses weren't that important, but sometimes we did break in horses. And I said, our people used to lean on the gates and watch the white man break in horses. They'd get on the back of the horse and up and down, whoosh, plop. Get on the horse again, up and down, whoosh, plop. Up again, whoosh, plop. And so this went on till the poor guy had so many bones broken or bruises all over his body. And the Indians thought, good heavens, what's the matter with the white man? Why don't they break a horse incorrectly? So one day, this guy comes up to me, he said, how did you people break in a horse? I said, we got a wild horse, he was tethered, and it usually broke in the hot season in June, July. We didn't give him a drop of water till he was gasping after three days. And then, with a tame horse on each side of him, we'd lead him down to the water, and he would start drinking. <laughs> tummy would be so full he could hardly move. Then the Indian would mount that horse and start to break him in. But if that horse was still feisty, still feisty and went on bouncing with the tame horses, they'd drag him into the water till he was up to here. And now with a full stomach and in the deep water, if you've tried to run in deep water, you know the struggle you had. And then the Indian would mount on the back of him and break him in without any trouble. You see, Indians always believe in doing the things the easy way. For instance, we would, a white man would get a saw and work hard, two of them with a saw, backwards and forwards, muscles aching to bring down a tree. Indian packed clay up about three foot round it and lit a fire and then sat back there and smoked and waited for the fire to do it. And the fire burned around, it wouldn't go up on account of the wet clay and down would come the tree. The white man said, gee, these Indians are smart. And that's the way we did it years ago. We brought the trees down. And I always remember a white man going up to an Indian. He saw him sitting under a tree. He said, there's a lazy bum. I'm gonna have a talk with him. He went up to this Indian, he says, hey, you know what you should do? And he says, no, what should I do? He said, you should go out and get yourself a job. He said, then what? 
And he says, and save up a lot of money in the bank. He says, then what? He says, then you'd be independent. He says, why? He said, you wouldn't have to work. He said, India not working now. <laughs> any questions? Anybody like to ask a question before we go any further? Because we've got a lot to talk about. Yes, sir. I'd like to know how your life was as a boy. How my life was as a boy. Well, I had a good grandfather who took a deep interest in me. As a boy, I was in very poor health. And I was very sick. And my mother was very bewildered. She went to the wrong source. She went to a white doctor in town and said, what's wrong with my son? So he punched me over and thumped me and gave me stuff and it didn't improve me one bit. So she took me to another white doctor and he says, your boy's not gonna live. He'll never make it within time. nine months, he'll be dead. She wasn't satisfied, she went to another doctor, another white doctor, and he gave her the same answer, second opinion, no, within nine months, he'll be dead. She gave up then until somebody said, well, what about the medicine man? She said, well, the white doctors have a lot of knowledge and they have all kinds of medicines and they said, my son is going to die. So she said, I'm going to see the medicine man. Medicine man took me out and he says, take a deep breath. I tried to take a deep breath and my lungs are so small. <sighs> I couldn't really take a deep breath. He said, this is what we're going to concentrate on. He took me up to the mountains and made me take deep breaths and made me stretch my hands out and bring them back to bring my lungs out to the full capacity and says now breathe oxygen i breathed the oxygen and it made me dizzy but he kept on five breaths the next day ten breaths till the end of the week i was taking 50 in that rarefied air and to top it off he gave me a black substance made from roots that he pounded up it tasted horrible and I had to drink that. That was the one thing I was terrified of the treatments. The breathing, I didn't mind so much. But I outlived, I outlived the three doctors that said I was going to die. I'm here today, thanks to the medicine man, and I'm 76 years of age. I hope I answered your question, sir. My grandfather was a great man. He took me along the banks of the Grand River in Canada, and he had a rifle, a white man's Winchester. And he says, come on, son. I was his grandson, but he always called me son. He said, come on, son. He says, let's, look, let's get some deer. We'll take some venison home for mama. And uh, I said, I'll go out and scout, Grandpa. And I went along the banks of the river and I found the tracks of the deer. I says, Grandpa, over here. He says, what is it? I said, tracks of the deer. He came over and he looked. He said, no good, son. He said, that deer left here th three days ago. And that's how I first learned to track. And he taught me tracking. At the time of a deer, I could tell the height of a man, his weight, what tribe he belonged to, which direction he was traveling, whether he had water with him, all kinds of things, just from the knowledge my grandfather taught me. And I would never have had that knowledge if I hadn't been a sick boy, because I sat there bathing in the glory of my grandfather when he taught me all these ancient things that have vanished from the earth. And I have this knowledge today and I'm passing it on to young people in the schools, teaching them how the Indian track, how he knew when an enemy was near, knew when a friend was near, and so on. And your question led into that, which shows you we never know where this is going unless questions are asked. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Let's lead into something exciting. Anyone want to know? Any yes, ma'am. A yeah, lady wants to know about Geronimo. You're very fortunate because I met Geronimo's grandson in 1964, just before he died. And he says, Chief White Eagle, I am going to give you information that has never, ever been given to any newspaper or any magazine. He said, it is yours to do as you wish with it. And he taught me the secrets of Geronimo's military escapades. I said, how in the world did your grandfather manage to defeat, defy the cavalry? 
He said, very easily. I said, but how? He said, my grandfather only had 30 men in his army at a maximum. He used to like to attack with five. 30 was the maximum he had, and he outwitted the cavalry left and right, and finally in desperation, the President of the United States said, we've got to stop Geronimo. He had 500 cavalrymen in the field, he increased it to 1,000. The following year, he increased it another 1,000. The fourth year, another 1,000, till there were 5,000 mounted cavalry searching for this little band of Apaches. Finally, somebody got smart and suggested, why not use Indian against Indian? Use the Navajos to track him down. They did. And in spite of that, they had problems. Which leads me to the story of Geronimo that I like most. I can tell you folks his battle tactics, how he escaped, how he ran away to come back and fight another day. I won't tell you that today. What I'm going to tell you is Geronimo's connection with me. And you look at me and say, well, that's impossible. This is how it all happened. I was sitting in a restaurant in Chicago. Two Indians walked in. One was tall, dignified, and a mane of white hair flowed down over his shoulders like a lion's mane. The other was a younger man, a little rotund, and they sat at the table, and being Indian, I went over and I said, I am a member of the Six Nations, what tribe do you belong to? And the old man looked at me, gnarled and wizened, his face wrinkled with burning suns of the desert, and he went. And I said to the younger man, what's wrong with him? He said, he's an old time Navajo, he doesn't speak much English. I said, well, what's he here for? He said, he's on his way to Washington for the centennial of his regiment to receive a Purple Heart and a medal for bravery. I brightened up, I said, hey, this is wonderful. I said, can he tell me? The old man seemed to know exactly what I like water from a tap. And the younger man had a job keeping up, interpreting fast in English. I was engrossed. It happened many years ago, back in the 1880s. He said, I was a young man back in those days. And I decided to join the army, the cavalry. I came in, I was inducted into the cavalry, and I went to this fort, and seated at the table was a young lieutenant. He said, what is your name, uh, Private? Dashnafli is not Baksni Hoslatnam. He said, what? I can't pronounce that. He said, my name is King. I'm Lieutenant King, I shall give you my name. From now on, you'll be known as King. A young corporal passed through, he said, Corporal, what's your first name? He said, Jeffrey, sir. He said, right, your name now is Jeffrey King in the Army. The station of military tactics with the cavalry, although his own cavalry was far superior. But he went in, he had a carbine, they gave him a water canteen, dry tack, and within a week or so, they were sent out. And the young lieutenant, who was straight out of West Point, green as all get out, had never seen an Indian in his life, never been in the desert, was sent out to track down who? Above all peace and people, Geronimo. A name that struck terror into the settlers. The Spaniards called him Hornet. Uh, Horonimo, the H, the J is pronounced like an H, Horonimo, which was actually uh, a disparaging remark. It meant little Jeremy. But that soon turned to terror when Geronimo struck at the wagons coming across the deserts, struck terror into the hearts of the settlers. But now, this young lieutenant took his six Navajo scouts 
and in high spirits he set out. Their canteens were full of life-giving precious water. They had the hard tack to see them through. Their carbines were there, they had a good supply of ammunition, and in good spirits they set out across that desert. One day passed, and the heat was merciless. It blazed down from that sun, that sun blazed down, and it was like a baking oven. It was hard to breathe, the heat was so great. 102 degrees. Out they went into that great, vast wasteland. Nothing but saguaro cactus, Gila monster rattlesnakes. On they went, pushing into that vast wilderness. And then, that young lieutenant had an idea because they'd been sipping on the water very lightly and suddenly he, a thought struck him. Supposing we don't find any more water, check your canteens. The Navajos dutifully checked their canteens. They were down to halfway and that meant one thing only. Halfway meant they just had half a canteen to get back to the fort. That young man had to make a serious decision. He had the lives of six Navajos in his hand and his own future. Okay, he made the decision. We return, we go back to the fort. But just at that moment, something turned up to change the whole episode. There was a wild yell, hi, hi, and over the hills bounded one of the lieutenant, one of the uh, uh, young Navajos who were out seeking the footprints. He came back, he says, I found them, I found them. Tracks of the Apaches just over there. Oh, this changed the whole story. Now he could gain glory, go back and maybe get two bars up there instead of one. He had found the tracks of Geronimo. Okay, he said, we go, but wait a minute. Water. Everybody take a sip. They took a sip of the water. He said, if we're going to follow them, where are we going to get water? It's all right, said one of the Navajos, just a few leagues away from here, under the escarpment is a well that our people have dug for many years. It's never, ever let us down. We shall find water there. Okay, said the lieutenant, he brightened up. He said, I tell you what we do, without the horses, we go nowhere. Give me your hat. One of, the, one of the young men took off his big hat and they poured the remainder of the water into this big hat and fed it to the horses. At first, the Navajos locked a gas, giving away precious water. Oh, but young white man is smart. Without horses, we go nowhere. And they pushed on. The next day, they were in sorry straits because that blazing sun was coming down. It was like walking into an oven. Finally, they got to the spot. Yo-ho! The cavalry came to a halt. The young men dismounted. One went to the back of the mules that they had been lugging behind them, took out one of the shovels, and started to dig. Right here, dig. Up went the sand, the shovels were going. The other four Navajos, who were older men, began to sing a little chant. And the song meant, when we get back to the fort, the presents we're going to buy our wives, and they were in a jolly mood. Hey, I'm all, hey, yo, me, ya, hey, ya, hey, yo, hey, ya. They were so happy. Water was right here. Now the whole situation has changed. But after a few moments, there came a dead silence. All eyes now turned towards the holes that were being dug, and the sand was shooting out the top. The four men went over and the lieutenant and they peered down into the pit and the two young men were down there. And they looked at the expression on the young man's face down below. He put his hands into the dry sand and raised it up to the sky. We have no water. The young man, the lieutenant was aghast. My God, what have I led my men into now? Not a drop of water, and not an, too far back to get back to the fort. Death staring them in the face. We push on. Which direction? Jeff King, 
talked it over, and one of the young men pointed. We head northwest, and they pushed into that burning desert. And the next day they were in sorry streets. Their lips were black, cracked, and bleeding. The young lieutenant looked ahead of him, and the saguaro cactus seemed to be waving, just like seaweed under a turbulent sea. And he knew that his mind was going with the heat. Jeff King sat there tight, and there came a moan behind him. He looked back, and the ice young man had fallen across his horse. His arms hanging limp and his body swinging with the swaying of the horse. Jeff King was too far gone to go back and help that young man. Too far gone. And suddenly a great shadow swept across. Jeff King looked up. Oh my God! In their head circling over were the birds of prey. They swept across, waiting for the victims down below. A question of time when they dropped and the buzzards would come down and feed on them. He looked up again fearfully as the black shadows crossed and recrossed over his head. The horses pushed on. The lieutenant's head now was sagging. He was trying to keep up a brave morale in front of his troops, but his head began to drop. And the horses now began to stagger. They'd had no water either, and they were staggering. And suddenly, the miracle happened. But was it a miracle? Ahead of them came a whinny from the leading horse. Jeff King thought, I know. They've detected the Apaches. They're waiting now in ambush, waiting to send out a hail of death when we come within range. And the horse began to pick up speed. And then a second thought entered his head. Maybe, just maybe, there was water somewhere ahead. And the horses began to pick up a little bit weak as they were and gallop. And as they came over the next sand dune, there in front of his eyes, the most amazing sight was green trees out in that desert, an oasis. His heart gave a flip. He looked and he spurred the horse, but there was no need to spur it because the horse was getting faster and faster, as weak as it was. And it pulled up with a skid right at the edge of that oasis. And there in the center of that oasis was a well. Oh my God, a well. We're saved. He rushed over, he got down weakly off that horse and he staggered towards the well. And a voice barked out, stand back from that water. He looked up. There was a bearded rancher there. Click, click, the almonds, click, click of the Winchester. And he came up, was pointing straight at his head. Please, my men are dying of thirst. I am a representative of the United States government, an officer in the army. But he realized that his uniform was plastered in gray. The blue wasn't showing through. He brushed the dust of the desert of days of driving through that burning furnace and showed his epaulets. I am a representative of the United States Army. My horses are dying. My men, for God's sake, let us have water. The rifle came up. One more step and you're a dead man. That young man had all the guts in the world. As weak as he was, he staggered towards the well raised his revolver, his 45, to shoot the lock off. He pulled the trigger, and the two guns blazed in unison. The crack came out. A hole appeared in the center of his head, and the blood gushed out. He spun round like a rag doll and dropped to the ground. The Navajo stopped back, horrified. They had never, ever seen a white man killed by a white man an officer of the United States Army. Now there was the ominous click, click as another one went into the breach and the rifle came up again. And this time it was pointed directly at Jeff King's head. Weak as Jeff King was, he dropped to one knee and whipped down to the 45, pulled it up using the last of his strength. He brought it up towards the rancher. The two guns again 
crashed simultaneously. Bang! And this time Jeff King dropped. The bullet sped through the top of his skull and opened up a furrow. The old man stopped in his narration there in that restaurant in Chicago, and he lent the great white mane of hair down and parted it back to show the great scar that he'd got in 1886. They were too weak to go on. They went to the water, they fed the horses, they drank it, and they collapsed in the shade of that oasis. An easy victim for any Apache that would come along would have killed them with ease. They could not have protested. They were too weak and tired to bury that young officer. And in the morning, refreshed, they buried him and they put a stick in there and put his kepi on top to mark his grave. And then they moved out. Within a half an hour, they came across the tracks of Geronimo. 30 Apaches, women and children. It was a place called Skeleton Valley. They moved to the top of the escarpment and they looked down. And what a sight met their eyes. There was Geronimo. He held a rifle, surrendered it to General Miles, and 5,000 mounted cavalry were in that valley. They were ragged, exhausted, without water or food, and he gave the rifle up as a symbol of his submission. At that critical moment of him handing that rifle over, an army news cameraman snapped the picture. Bang went the light, it burst the bubble. He got that picture, and I have a copy of that picture, one of my proudest possessions taken in a split second in the year 1886. The other copy is in the Smithsonian Institute. A lot of people are saying, well, what happened then? The old man went on to New York to the Centennial Hearst Regiment. He received the Purple Heart. He received a Medal for Valor. It was reported in the newspaper and I cut it out. I've got it in my possessions. And then he moved back to the Southwest to the quiet and serenity of the desert that he loved so well. And within three months, the gallant old warrior had passed on to the great beyond. This, ladies and gentlemen, is not fiction. It's a true story. The records be, can be found at Fort Sill. And I hope you enjoyed the story. Thank you. God bless. A young Indian went to a banker to borrow some money. He heard you could borrow money from bankers. And the banker said to him, how many horses you got? He says, I got 200 horses. Good, I'll loan you the money to start your farm. He gave him the money. Within a month, he was digging and up came oil. He was worth millions. The banker heard about this and he went to them. He said, hey, you got a, a million dollars or more. You better put it in my bank for safety. The Indian turned around and looked at the banker. He says, how many horses have you got? <laughs> the story I like best, though. This is a humdinger. How many fishermen here? Any fishermen? Oh, good, we got fishermen. Any, any other, any more fishermen back there? Okay. You know, People think we Indians are super people. We don't get sick, we don't wear eyeglasses, we don't use crutches, but we do. We're the same as any other race. Some of us limp, some of us catch cold. We're no different, human beings. We're supposed to possess magic qualities. And one tourist went to a village, an Indian village, and he said, 
I want to go fishing. Have you got a guide? All my guides are out. He says, well, what about you? No, he says, I don't take parties out. He says, look, I've been good to your people. I've given you donations, money, I've brought clothes. Yeah, said the chief, that's right, you have. All right, I'll take you out. They went out on the canoe and they paddled out. And the chief did a very mysterious thing. He looked over the keel of the canoe Drop him hook here. The white man dropped a hook. Up came fish. He says, we move. They paddled the canoe further on. Again, he did the mysterious thing. Drop hook here. And so it went on. Dropping hook, hook, hook. Up came fish, time after time. The white man was absolutely bewildered. He says, what wonderful ESP. What secrets of nature does the Indian possess? Oh, I can't tell you great Indian secret. He said, but I've been good to your people. I'm a true friend. He says, raise your right hand and swear honest Indian. He said, honest Indian, I'll never divulge great tribal secret. And he didn't. He said, when Indian goes out on the Great Lake and looks way into the depths, when he sees the biggest concentration of white man's beer cans, he knows it's a good fishing spot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, let's see how time is. I'm limited in my time because I have to make way for other people. Yeah, my time is up, but anyway, once again, ladies and gentlemen, you've been a wonderful audience. I hope to see you all next year. We'll have more stuff. Gee, the cavalry again. <laughs> we hope to have more stories to regale you. Thrilling stories, no fiction. I never deal in fiction. I give you the true stories. But my stories, I have to tell you, are uh, registered and copyrighted, so please, don't use them professionally. If you want to show your friends at home, that's a different matter. So once again, and last time, hope to see you all back in good health next year. For now, I will say, I'm going to give you the Indian sign. I touch my heart on my thumb, with my thumb to the heart, because Indians believe that friendship came from the heart. I swing it out. My friendship goes out to you, raising the hand up, showing there's no weapon. So let's see what kind of friendship we have here. Everybody touch your heart, swing it out, raise it up. Oh, beautiful. Thank you all. God bless. Goodbye. <laughs>